All right, good morning, everybody. We're so thankful for your presence today. It is a beautiful kind of overcast. Uh, looks like rain in the forecast, kind of Lord's Day, but that just means the weather is pleasant. It's not too hot for uh, here in the middle of July, so we're thankful for that. And we're thankful that you're here worshiping with us uh, here at North Heights. As you know, all year long, Alex and I are in the midst of this series that we are doing, this theme, I guess I should call it, uh, for the whole year, as we have done for the past several years. We're taking just one simple idea and we're building on it in various kinds of sermons. And as you know, now that we're halfway through the year, it's no secret, we're spending all year long talking about these three little words, love your neighbor. And we said this at the very beginning of the year, how it's, it's a simple statement, but it's extremely versatile. You can take that in a lot of different directions. And I think, having now gone through a little over half the year, I think you would agree that we have not run out of ideas, that we have found a lot of ways to take this uh, simple command by our Lord, which is found in other verses and texts as well in the New Testament and Old, uh, and, and use it for, our, for our, all of our spiritual betterment. But... As we have considered that, one thing that we've tried to do this year, and we just, just a few times, just peppering it throughout the year, is we are considering that statement in its fuller context. Because if you take the words, when Jesus says, love your neighbor, that is just a sliver of a larger statement. So just here in the introduction this morning, as I build to the point of what we're going to be considering today, let's just zoom out a little bit. Yes, Jesus tells us to love our neighbor, but what in addition does he say? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now that ends the statement. Love your neighbor, but to the extent, as much as, and you should, to the extent as, and as much as, you love yourself. You cannot effectively love your neighbor if you haven't first loved yourself. And if you only love yourself and don't know, and don't love your neighbor, well, you're not doing right there either. So with that said, that secondary phrase, one thing that Alex and I are doing this year, just in a few times, is we are considering how we need to love ourselves and the importance in taking care of self. And we, so we've considered that already in a couple of different ways. We've looked at it from the physical standpoint. We've looked at it from the spiritual standpoint. We have one more that will be coming later this year, but we have one that we're going to consider again this morning. To understand how we're going to get there, let's just keep zooming out in this statement that is very famous by the Lord. Yes, he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, but what does he say just preceding that? He says, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like to it that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so now, once you've zoomed out a little bit more, now you realize, oh, this is just half of a bigger answer to a question the Lord has been asked. The first half, you get a tease of it there. Yes, it's on the right slide. I got nothing working over there. So you have just a teaser of it. This is the first commandment. Whatever he just said was the first, meaning the primary, fundamental, most significant commandment. And then he says, and the second commandment is like to it, which is that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, all right, now let's just zoom out again. Because what has he said is the first and great commandment. This statement, and we could keep zooming, but we'll just stop right there. But just to fill you in, Jesus, as you may know, was asked the question, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? If I had just one commandment, what would that one commandment be, Master? If you had just one commandment to tell, Rabbi, what what commandment would you tell? And Jesus says, here is your first and great commandment. Here is what you should do. And if you take care of this one, everything else will fall into place. You should love God. And he doesn't just say love God. He says you should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Other translations will add a second or fourth uh, to that love God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength, which could be in terms of intensity, but let's just keep it to what the text here says. You should love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, with all of your passions, with all of your desires, with all of your focus. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first and great commandment. And the second commandment that I would give, attached to that, tethered as an appendage to that, is like it, and that is likewise you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I don't know if you follow, but it seems like in this text that there are in fact three entities that require my love that I should put forth my maximum effort into loving. And if I love these three entities as the Lord defines, then I will be doing exactly what the Lord wants of me 
Entity one, love God. Entity two, love neighbor. And number three, love self. Now, I said this in the pew bulletin, and I'll say it again. We might find it very easy to love God. After all, he showers us with blessings every day. We might even find it easy to love neighbor. But we often will struggle with loving self. We might find it easier to love our neighbors, these people who we only see in some, of the, some circumstances, that we only see occasionally, who we only see a part of, and really whatever they want to show us of themselves, mentally, emotionally, and so forth. We only will see a, a fraction of them, and we can find it easier to love them than we could find it to love self. Why is that? I think I hinted at it just there. We only see what our neighbors show us. Sometimes we can peek behind the curtain and see a little bit more, and nevertheless, we're still commanded to love. But there is no curtain with self. We see all of ourselves and all of our naked glory and sometimes in glory. We see wholly who we are. And it's not always very holy who we are. We see exactly what we are. We know our every thought, many of which would shame us if we spoke them out loud, which is why we keep them in our minds. And so we know self. And sometimes self is not very loving or lovable. And so, yes, I can love God. I can love you, but I have a heart sometimes to love me. Nevertheless, it is a commandment to love me as I love you, as I love God. Now, how am I supposed to love self? Well, how am I supposed to love God? He tells you in the text, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. How am I supposed to love you? I'm supposed to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind. How am I supposed to love self? I'm supposed to love self with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. It is hard sometimes to mentally love myself. That is to say, it is hard sometimes to get inside my headspace and just stay there. Loving myself physically, okay, I know the need to exercise. I know the need to have a, a good diet. I know the need to take care of myself and what not to put in my body and what to put in my body. I get that. Loving myself in, a, in an emotional sense, okay, fine, I understand the need to project that kind of uh, self-confidence um, attitude. I understand that. But loving myself in my own head space, when I just have my thoughts, that's not so easy. Now, I'm just speaking for myself. You have to decide for yourself. But I've talked to enough people over the many years that I've been alive. I've talked to enough people who will say the same thing. So I don't think I'm alone in saying it's hard sometimes when I put myself in my mind to love what's in there and to use my mind to love myself because sometimes my mind works against me. Sometimes my mind makes it hard to love at all, especially to love self. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Love yourself mentally. How do we love ourselves mentally what does the bible say about what we're going to use which is a phrase you hear a lot these days uh, as a needed topic of study and consideration mental health now i want to say this just as an introduction all right and again i said this in the pew bulletin uh you can read that in more detail but just to summarize that understand this whenever i or alex or any of our peer preachers any of our contemporary preachers uh, when we preach on, let's say, baptism, all right, a fundamental topic you'll hear more than twice in a sermon throughout the year, or when I preach on the one church of Jesus Christ, or when I preach on the grace of Christ or the blood of Christ, or I preach on Moses, fundamental Bible topics, right? When I preach on them, understand, I, I understand, I want you to understand that I understand, that I am standing on the shoulders of giants, that I'm standing on the shoulders of great preachers of before, of past generations who talked about these issues and those fundamental Bible topics, who made it their emphasis, and who laid that foundation of Bible understanding. And then I came along later and sat at their feet, and they taught it to me, and now I preach it to you. And so when I preach to you about baptism, 90% of what you hear from me is going to be something that I learned from someone else, who themselves learned it from someone else. And that's okay. That's good. That's proper. That's, it's been vetted. It's been tested and tried and true. And so I am just standing on the foundation of what's already been laid, and all I can do is just build on it. 
and go deeper into those studies from that foundation that's already been laid. I sat at the feet when I was in preaching school of a gospel preacher named Garland Elkins, a name you may, none of you may know. Garland Elkins preached all over the east side of the Mississippi River and everywhere else in the world, but prim- primarily there. He was on the Phil Donahue show once in the 80s because the lady was suing her congregation because they withdrew fellowship from her because she was sinning and they were following 1 Corinthians 5. And so she sued them and it became a big scandal. And the church called on Garland Elkins to defend the truth. And he gets on Donahue's show and he was the only one. He was on an island. And they were all attacking him. And all he was doing was just quoting scripture, quoting scripture, quoting scripture. I got to sit at his feet while he would sometimes have his Bible open upside down. And he would be looking like he was reading because he's so modest. And he's just quoting scripture. From, from the American Standard or the King James, from the Greek or the English or the Hebrew or the English, just quoting and quoting and quoting. I got to sit at his feet, and I promise you, more than 50 times in a 52-week sermon series of a year, if you hear me preach, 45 of them, I'm going to say something that I learned from him. He sat at the feet of N.B. Hardiman. He was a student of N.B. Hardiman himself at, at Freed Hardiman College. You always come from somebody else. Someone's laid a foundation before you. Now, I say all that to say this. We're talking this morning about mental health. And you can dig and you can scrounge and you can search and you can find pieces, a a sermon here, an article there, but it is scant. It is small, minor. There is not a lot in past generations written or spoken or preached on this subject because it's only become a thing we're comfortable talking about in this generation. And so I can't go to preachers of yesteryear and say, well, what, what foundation did they lay by preaching on this from a Bible standpoint? Because there, there isn't one. And so it is this generation of preachers who have to lay that foundation. So I, I want you to know that I recognize in this one sermon the burden of responsibility that comes with that, that I'm just going to lay a brick, right, in this sermon. You're not going to get comprehensive out discussion. You're not going to get everything there is to know. You're just going to get a brick in the foundation And hopefully the next generation will come along, having learned more, having understood it better, having had more experiences personally and without, that they can build on that foundation and dig deeper to help people who are struggling with mental health issues. Now, I'm not the first one to talk about this even here. Alex, if you remember a couple of years ago, preached I think it was a two-part series on anxiety. Those are the kinds of sermons that we're laying that foundation for the next generation to build on. Now, I want you to know why that's important. And then I'll preach to you, I promise. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the expression. There's, there's a phrase that comes up a lot uh, when you talk about religion and culture. And the phrase is this. Religion is downstream of culture. You ever heard that expression? I get it, and I understand it, and I will even acknowledge its fact, but I don't like it, and I want to change it. What it means is culture defines, our culture defines what we consider right and wrong, what we consider taboo and acceptable, what we approve of and disapprove of. Culture defines all those things, and then downstream of that, religion comes along, and religion uses what we like and don't like and gives it a biblical slant, uses the Bible to say, here's why this is right and here's why this is wrong. Well, I don't like that, but I acknowledge that happens a lot, because what it ought to be is that religion should be upstream. Religion should be at the top of the mountain. Christianity should be the light of the world, and then down from it should flow all things that are right and wrong. The understanding of all things that are righteous and ungodly. The world should be looking to us because Jesus gave us that responsibility. I don't mean preachers, I mean you people. He gave us that responsibility to talk about issues so that the world, when they need the answers, will know a Bible answer first. Because you can look up and find a lot about mental health. And a lot of it is good. And some of it's not. And some of it's already considered antiquated and out of date and, and being replaced by new material. Here is material that is never antiquated. Here is material that never goes out of date. And if this book can help us with any topic, it could always help us with that topic. And believe it or not, this book can help you if you're struggling with mental health issues. And so it behooves us as Christians as ministers of the gospel, all people, I mean all Christians who are ministers of the gospel, it behooves all of us to talk about these issues. Pardon me, I hit the button. Y'all didn't say anything. It behooves all of us to talk about these issues so that we set the tone, we set the foundation, and culture that comes after us can follow 
what the Bible says. All right? Now, with all that said, here's your sermon. I have just two points. Half of them were already flashed on the screen a second ago. Uh, two, two characters, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Elijah and John the Baptist. Two people who, maybe not their entire lives, but for, for stretches of their lives, for moments in time, they struggled with one, one aspect of a mental health issue, which is depression. And mind you, it's just one, and there are many others. And more preachers and myself and others will need to focus on other issues in the future. But this morning, let's just talk about depression and see how Elijah struggled with it and see how John the baptizer also struggled with it. And as we go through this, with each of these two men, I have three points to share with you. The first of which in both categories is um, here is something for those of us who are trying to help people, something we need to keep in mind, something we need to be aware of. And the last two for each gentleman in question, these are things that we can find for hopefully some solace and comfort if we're the ones struggling with it, okay? Simple outline, let's dig into it. Let's start with Elijah, and let's notice, first of all, number one, open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18, for those of us who are not dealing with the issue at the moment, and we see someone who is that we're trying to help, or we love our neighbor, we wanna help our neighbor love themselves mentally, and they're struggling with this issue, let's understand that number one, if it's depression they're dealing with, Depression is not dependent on winning and losing. I say that to say this. You can't go to the person who's depressed and say, why are you depressed? Don't you realize all these things you have to be thankful for? Don't you realize all the victories that you've won through Jesus? Don't you know all that you've been given? Yes, they do. That's not the point. That's not the problem. Don't misunderstand and mistake depression as being ungrateful. A person who's depressed is not a person who has ingratitude problems. It's not a person who doesn't know or doesn't appreciate their blessings. It's not a person who's not aware of all the victories they've won through Jesus Christ. They can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4.13. And with his help, they've done many great things. And yet they still struggle with this. Because the problem is not what they've done in Christ. It is a mental thing that causes a cloud over those victories. Where they get to experience the actual victory, but not enjoy the victory. Where they get to experience the reality and the mental understanding on an intellectual level, yes, I won this victory, but they have no satisfaction in it because there is some kind of a disconnect in the mind. There's some kind of a cloud, a pall that hangs over it that prevents them from enjoying the victory, the sweet victory that they have in Jesus Christ or that they have in God in general. And to best illustrate that in the Old Testament, consider the humongous victory that Elijah has in 1 Kings 18. And uh, you guys... I thought about this because I practiced this sucker last night and it was 55 minutes and the, the bulk of it is because there's a lot of reading because if we read this, it's going to be uh, 1 Kings 18 verses 17 through 46 and then the beginning of 19. And I'm not the best public reader. I stumble over my words and I stutter sometimes. But darn it, we're reading this whole thing. Because I could summarize it for you, and I could animate it for you, and it'd be pretty entertaining, but I just want the text to speak for itself, okay? So let's just read it together. 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 17. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. When he saw Elijah coming, that Ahab said to him, Are you he that troubles Israel? Let's understand what's going on here. The, the nation is already dealing with a terrible drought that Elijah's getting the blame for. When you ought to be blaming yourselves because you're a wicked nation and God's punishing you. But they're turning around. Are you the one who's been troubling Israel? 18. And Elijah answered, I haven't troubled Israel, but you and your father's house. In that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather unto me unto Israel, uh, all Israel unto Mount Carmel. And all the prophets of Baal, 450. And all the prophets of the groves, 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel is the queen of the northern kingdom, a worshiper of Baal, a corrupter of good men. And so she's really at the center of this. Ahab is just her puppet, basically. He's just the pansy going along with her orders. So Elijah says, I haven't been troubling Israel. It's been you. So let's put this to a test. Let's end this once and for all. You gather all your prophets and all the prophets of Baal and all those who are secondary prophets. It's going to be a total of 850. And I'll come there too. Me, myself, and I will go there. Unto Mount Carmel. Verse 20. So Ahab sent to the children of Israel and gathered all the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto the people and said, he says to the people, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long are you going to be stuck at a fork in the road not knowing who you're going to serve? And so he puts the question to them. If God is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. 
And the people said nothing because they're spectators and they want to see what's going to happen next. 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. Actually, no, we'll get there. He's mistaken, but that's his mindset. I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets, you see, are 450 men. Let them, therefore, give us two sacrificial animals. And let them choose one for themselves and cut it in pieces and put it on the wood, but don't put any fire under it. And I'll dress the other one, and I'll lay it on the wood, and I'll put no fire under it either. We're going to build some altars. We're going to offer some sacrifices. And I'm going to put my sacrifice here on the wood with no fire. We're not going to burn it. You put yours on the altar of your wood, but no fire. You're not going to burn it either. Verse 24. And you call on the name of your gods, Baal among them, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, yeah, it's well spoken. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's, that's what we should do. Okay, perfect. Now we have a perfect test. I'm not going to do anything but put my sacrifice there. And I'm going to let God do his thing. If he wants to sacrifice to burn, God will send his fire down. If Baal wants his sacrifice to burn, Baal will send his fire down. Verse 25. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one for yourselves. Dress it. Um, address it first because there's many of them and call on the name of your gods but don't put any fire under it 26 so they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and they called in the name of Baal from morning until noon saying oh Baal hear us but there was no voice nor any that answered and they leapt upon the altar which was made which if you want your god to consume it with fire leaping on top of it is kind of a desperate move Right? Do you agree with that? They are, they are basically conceding their lives in desperate hope for Baal. Like, I don't know if we appreciate what we just read there. They get on the altar that they want their God to burn with fire because they're so desperate that they're willing to sacrifice themselves just for their, their God to hear them because their relationship with their God is one of human sacrifice. And you'll see that as the text continues. Verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. And said, maybe you should cry louder. Because, you know, he's a god. Maybe he's talking to somebody else. Maybe he's going for a poop. That's literally what it says when he says he's pursuing. Maybe he's off on a journey somewhere. Maybe he's sleeping and needs to be awakened. And so they cried louder. Which, and he's mocking them and saying cry louder. But they're out of options. So they take the mocking advice and they apply it. Maybe we should cry louder. So they cry louder. And then it gets really sad. In verse 28, it says they cut themselves. But that would be, if that was all it said, that'd be bad enough. And you would say, look how desperate they are that they think they need to open their, their veins. They need to open their flesh and pour blood on the altar. But then it says they cut themselves after their manner. This is their religion. This is what their God demands. Sacrifice of a human kind. With knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, verse 29, that they prophesied to the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, deadline time. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one regarded them. And Elijah said to the people, you lose. Now everybody come near. Everybody gather in close. And all the people came near. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down, and he built up his own one. And he took 12 stones, verse 31, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom God said, Israel is his name. 32. And with the stones he built his own altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar that would contain two measures of seed. And he put wood in order like it's supposed to be laid. And he cut his lamb into sacrifices and laid it on the wood. And then he said, now I want you to fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So they soaked it. And then he said, 34, now do it a second time. So they soaked it a second time. And then he said, now do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water poured out over it and all the way around this trench that he'd done, this moat around his altar. So it was completely soaked with water. It's pretty hard to light it on fire if it's soaked with water. 36. It came to pass at the time of the offering that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am just your servant, that I have done all things at your word. Hear me, Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and consumed the wood, and consumed the stones, and consumed the dust, and consumed the water, licked it all up, so there was nothing left in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You can say that again. 
40. And Elijah said to them, uh, take the prophets of Baal. Don't let anybody escape. So they took, because they're fixing to run. So they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Remember the drought? It's fixing to end. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went and he looked, and he said, I don't see anything. And he said, go back seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he looked and he said, well, I see a cloud, a little bitty cloud, it looks like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and get down from the mountain because the rain's about to come, but it won't stop you. The drought's about to end by the power of God. Now, Elijah, we're almost done with the chapter. Elijah has proven not only that he's greater than Baal, not only that he's the bringer of the drought, but also that he's the bringer of the rain. He has given you three times over a good reason to stop serving Baal and to start serving him because you know they were begging Baal for some rain and they were getting nothing. And now Elijah says, rain's coming. You better hurry home. 45. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. That's the Old Testament way of saying he was blessed and girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Get on, get, get, get. Hurry on home. Because I've proven I won. That's what he's doing. I proved I won. I proved my God is better. This is a tremendous victory by the prophet of God. Do you see that now? Do you see how, obviously it's God's victory, but Elijah got to be the centerpiece of it. He got to be the facilitator of it. He was the man in the middle saying, look what God can do. This is his big victory. Now open to the next chapter, 19.1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now what he should have done, as he should have said, your God lost, his God won, this is our heritage, that's the God of our ancestors, Ahab should say, so we're going to serve that God. But he doesn't do that. He cowers and he shrinks and he tattles to his wife. Verse 2, And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, quote, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I don't kill you as you kill those prophets by tomorrow at this time. Jezebel's message is, I am prepared for my gods to kill me. Well, spoiler, Jezebel, your God can't even summon a fireball. He's not killing you, but that's what she thinks. I am prepared for my God to kill me if I don't kill that guy for killing all of our prophets. That's her threat. By tomorrow this time, I'm coming for your head. Verse 3, and when Elijah got that message, he gets up and he ran for his life and he came to Beersheba in Judah and he left his servant there. And he went another day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested, here was our reading, for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough. I'm out of ideas. Now, O Lord, take away my life because I'm not better than my father's. Take away my life because I'm as big a failure as those who came before me. Now, your instinct might be to say, what's your problem, Elijah? You had this great victory. You have no reason to be upset because look what you've achieved. Look what you won. Don't you see? Don't you know? Yes, he sees. Yes, he knows. He was there. His problem is there is a cloud that is hanging over him that has actually been hanging over him even in the midst of his victory. Do you remember when he was talking to those prophets, he falsely said, I am the only one left. That is a, a tell for someone in the middle of a good day that there's something wrong there that we're going to need to help them with. Because Elijah thinks he's the only one. Well, then what do you think is going to happen when he has a victory as big as that and nobody changes? He has a victory as huge as that was and people are still trying to kill him. The king is still against him. The queen's still trying to take off his head. Nobody's rallying to his side. He still feels like he felt before all alone. You see how there's no difference? I'm all alone, but I'll win this victory through God. I'm all alone. Apparently, it wasn't that big a victory. He thinks he's all alone. He thinks he has nothing. He thinks he has no one. Well, Elijah, don't you see this victory? The victory doesn't matter. It's up here. He has this cloud. He has this pall over him. So those of us who are trying to help people who are struggling with this, let's make sure we don't give them the wrong kind of advice or the wrong kind of help and say, well, can't you just see the facts? They know the facts. It doesn't matter. In fact, as big a victory as this was, that probably contributed to his depressed state here. Because if it had been a small victory, it's only a small failure in his mind. It was a huge victory, and nothing changed, so he feels like a huge failure. Do you see that? 
Let's be mindful of that as we try to help people. Two more very quickly with Elijah. Look at verses 5 through 8 where we left off. And let's understand something. Let's never underestimate the value, the aid that comes with a good meal and some exercise. In fact, Tommy mentioned this in class if you were in the uh, room one class this morning. But let's see how it's put into action. Look at verse number 5. As Elijah lay and slept under a juniper tree, I just want to pause real quick. Sorry for interrupting the Holy Spirit. Um, You maybe have seen this meme on Facebook in in places where it'll say, Elijah was told by God to take a nap and have some food. So never underestimate the value in a good meal and a good nap. Okay, ha, ha, ha. But God didn't tell him to take a nap. God's going to tell him to do the opposite. I want you to see the Bible truth and not what you read on Facebook, which is hardly ever the Bible truth. Verse 5. He's laying down, he's sleeping under the juniper tree, and then an angel comes and touches him and says, get up and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he ate and drank and then laid down again. Because when you feel defeated, your inclination is to lay down and quit. Verse seven, the angel comes back to him and says, arise and eat. And now he tells him why. Because you have a journey ahead of you. You have work yet to do. And it's too far for you to go on such an empty stomach. So get up and eat and get your strength because God still has work for you to do. Verse 8, and so he rose, he ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, where the law was given. This was a person who was ready to lay down and die. He's requested it, now he's just laying down and waiting for it to happen. But God is not finished with him yet. God is not content with him to lay down and die. God is saying to him, get up, get something to eat, and go back to work. Because what we now understand, which God always knew, is there is a link between the mind and the body. That it matters what you put in your body, how it affects your mind, and what you put in your mind, how it affects your body, and how your mental state makes you not want to work, and how by getting up and getting active can improve your mental state. All these things are being written in in papers and research studies today, but God understood it. Of course he did. He made mind and body. He understood there was always a link there. And we know this, we've just never understood it. The placebo effect links the mind and the body, and we don't understand how it works, and other things. Well, here God is saying, you're depressed. What's the solution? Get up and go to work. It's not going to solve your depression. It's not magic, but it will make you feel better because you'll be active putting your mind on something positive, constructive, little victory after little victory after little victory, one step in front of the other. Never underestimate what it does for your mental state when you eat a good meal and you get to work. And that's what God does to his prophet here. And just to finish the reading with our last point, I want you to remember, those of you who are struggling with this, you may feel it, but you are not alone. So look at verse 9. He came in the cave of Horeb, and he lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, you sent him there. God never asks questions because he doesn't know. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and slain all your prophets with swords. And I, even I only, same thing he said before, I'm the only one who is left that serves you. And now they want to take my life away. And God said, go out and stand on the edge of the mountain. And behold, the Lord passed by when he did. And a great strong wind rent the mountain, broke the mountain, and it broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But then it says, but the Lord was not in the mountain. God breaks the mountain with his mighty power, but God wasn't there. Keep going. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now, Elijah knows his Old Testament. He's living in it. Elijah knows his history. He knows that God spoke out of wind in Job 38. He knows that God spoke out of an earthquake in Exodus 19. He knows that God spoke out of fire in Exodus 3. But in all those times, God spoke not once to him. And I bet she's thinking, I guess I am all alone. But then, after the fire, verse 12, a small little voice. The King James says a still, small voice. A peace-bringing, soothing voice spoke to him. And he saw no source of origin. It was just the voice of God speaking to his inspired prophet. And when Elijah heard it, verse 13, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entering of the cave. And behold, there came another voice a second time saying, what are you doing here? And he repeated his statement before in verse 14. And God says, go back to the wilderness of Damascus where you came and anoint Hazael king over Syria and Jehu the son of Nimshi shall you anoint to be king over Israel. And if you, if you keep going, which I won't read, it's just a big laundry list of tasks to do. 
God telling him, you go do this. Get out of here now. You've heard me. I'm with you. Now go back to work. Go anoint this guy king. Go anoint that guy king. Go set up some prophets over here to do the work over there. Go over here and do this. Get busy. Get going. Get moving. Get working. Verse uh, 17. It shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. I hope you're writing all this down, Elijah. you got a big long list here. Oh, by the way, verse 18. By the way, I've got 7,000 people in Israel. Not a one of them have bowed the knee to Baal. I know you feel alone. Get out there and get to work and run into them along the way because there are 7,000 people who haven't given up either. And I'm not going to read to you, but if you go all the way down to the end of the text, verse 21, he returned back from him and took yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. The servant of Elijah, who he was sending to do all these tasks, when his tasks were done, he went back to Elijah and ministered to him because he saw in his boss, this guy needs a hand. This guy needs an arm around his shoulder. He needs to be reminded he's not alone. You will feel alone in your headspace because it's clouded and it's hard to see. It's my responsibility and all of yours to go to that person, to help them get up and get moving and to constantly remind them you're not alone. Yes, you have God, the breaker of mountains, the quaker of earths, the bringer of fire, the speaker of soft, of soft pleasant things. You have God and you have me here too. You're not alone. Now very quickly before we close, let's go to John the baptizer. Go to Matthew chapter three. Matthew 3, to start with, let's see his victory. And as we look at his story, it begins very similar to Elijah, with a great victory. But for those of us who are trying to help someone, let's be aware what it says here. Depression can make you doubt the things you know. So as you try to help this person, you might want to say, well, remember this, remember that. Don't you know better than to say those things that you're saying? Don't you know better what will happen if you do this? Don't you know? Yes, they know there's a pall, there's a cloud, there's a haze they cannot see through. So let's be aware of that. Let's look at, look at John the Baptizer, verse 1 of Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying to everybody, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan, and they were all baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins, because this great prophet has preached the word of God, and he's convicting their hearts, and he's getting all these many people to come to him to be baptized in preparation for the coming Messiah. And that has attracted attention, verse 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees the religious leaders, wicked in their hearts, coming to the baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? That's his way of saying, what are you doing here? Because I know it ain't because you think you're in the wrong. So why are you here? Who told you to worry about judgment to come? Because you don't act like you're worried about judgment to come, so what are you doing here? Well, they're there because everybody else is there, and they want to continue influencing the people. So look at verse 8. He tells them, you need to bring forth fruit that is worthy of repentance. Put your money where your mouth is, you hypocrites. Nine, and think not to say within yourselves, well, we don't need John the Baptist. He knows what they're thinking. We don't need John the Baptist, and we don't need his baptism. We have Abraham as our father. We have a relationship with God through our ancestry. And John scoffs at that, and he says, do you see that stone? You see that rock right there? If God wanted to, he could raise up children of Abraham from that rock. You see that stick over there? He can make a nation of Israel greater than this one from that stick over there. You see that pebble? That's the point he's making. You think you're special because your great-great-great-granddaddy was special? That makes him special, not you. And he's only special because God made him special. And the same God commands me to command you to be baptized in preparation for the Messiah. Verse 10. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which brings forth not good fruit, which he's just commanded them to do, is cut down and cast into the fire. What do you think he's telling them? He's telling them, you hypocrites, put your money where your mouth is and live righteous and actually faithful or you will burn forevermore. Keep that in mind when we keep reading. 11. I indeed baptize people with water under repentance, but he that comes after me, the Messiah, is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to bear. He shall baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
And my Pentecostal friends talk about this one all the time. They love the baptism of fire. They want the baptism of fire. And they never read the context because the baptism of fire is being covered in fire. And that's what the Pharisees are going to get if they don't change. These faithful people who came with honest hearts, they're going to get baptized. But these wicked people, they're going to get a different kind of baptism. They're going to burn. That's what John is saying. Twelve of the Messiah whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor. The fan, if you're thinking like it's one of these kind of fans, it's not. It's one of these kind of fans. It's a winnowing fan. You put the grain in this con contraption and you spin the winnowing fan and it separates the wheat from the chaff. The chaff is the husk. And you don't want the chaff. You don't need the chaff. You want the grain that falls. And the chaff, chaff blows into the wind or it's gathered up and it's burned. And so that fan separates. That fan purges. That's why he says what he says, verse 12, whose fake fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat to the garner but the chaff he'll burn up with unquenchable fire someone's getting the one someone's getting the other then came jesus from galilee to jordan unto john to be baptized of him but john forbade him saying i have need to be baptized of you and you're coming to me this is john recognizing that jesus is the one whose shoes he's not worthy to bear he knows who he's dealing with he knows this is the messiah uh, four, uh, 15, and Jesus answering said, allow this to be done because it is necessary for us to do the right thing. For such it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness, the King James says. It's right for you to baptize me and it's right for me to be baptized of you. Why? Because it's a command of God for all Judea and I'm all of Judea. So John allowed him. 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and lit upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And John was there. John was standing there with Jesus in his arms, having just lifted him out of the water. John saw the light. John heard the voice. Now, he may not have understood the words, because that's the thing in the Bible. When God speaks, everybody else just hears thunder. But John knows that. So he hears the thunderous voice of God booming from the heavens, and he already knows that this is the Messiah. He's already talked about him, introduced him that way. John, you know that. And he would say, yes, I know that. Now fast forward to Luke chapter 7 and see how the tables have turned for his mental state. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 16. Background very quickly, John is now in prison because he went to King Herod, the wicked King Herod, and he said, that lady that you're with is not your wife. You have no right to have her as your wife. You are sinning in the sight of God. That's the gist of it. The woman that you're with, you have no right to be with. And because he had the audacity to stand in the king's court and tell that to the king, he's found himself in prison. Unbeknownst to him, that woman has said to Herod, I want his head. I want it cut off. I want him dead. Sounds a little bit like Jezebel. There's a theme there. And that's where John finds himself, in prison. And in that time, Jesus continues teaching and preaching and doing great things. And look at the, the notoriety that the Messiah draws to himself. Verse 16, there comes a great fear on everybody. And they all glorified God, saying, a great prophet is risen among us, that God has visited his people. He's not talking about John. The people are talking about Jesus. This great prophet has come. God has visited us. Emmanuel, God is with us. This is who Jesus is. And all the people are starting to see this. And John is in prison. 17. And that rumor about Jesus went through all of Judea and throughout all the region around it. And the disciples of John showed him all those things that people are saying. And John called two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus with the message saying, Are you really he that should come or should we look for another? Nobody is asking that question anymore. Even the Pharisees are privately acknowledging it and plotting ways to kill him because of it. And all the average people, all the good-hearted people, are all understanding that, yes, this is the one who was to come. This is the Messiah. And the only guy now who seems to be doubting it is the guy who first preached it, who said, is he really the Messiah? Well, where were you two years ago? You were the first guy to say, here he is. Here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And now because you have one bad day, because you find yourself in prison, don't you know that God will bless you? Don't you know, Revelation 2.10, I know it hasn't been written yet, but don't you know the truth behind it? That if you're faithful, God will give you a crown of life? Don't you know? Yes, he knows. It doesn't matter. He feels bad. His mental state is clouded. Do you see that? He knows the facts. He was there. You weren't even there. He was there. He baptized the man. He knows but he cannot connect what he knows with what he's saying. 
because it just it doesn't seem right. Something is missing. And what's missing is this haze in the middle that makes him doubt what he actually knows. Depression does that to people. And we need to be aware of that so we can know what to say and what not to say. Because what they're going through, yes, they understand it intellectually. But sometimes they just want people to be around them to help them up and to remind them who they are. On that same note, keep going in the text. If you're in Luke 7, jump down. We're going to skip over something and we're going to come back to it. But go to verse 24. And as we do this, if you're struggling with this, take this to heart if you hear one and never underestimate the power or the value in a compliment. To, just, to allow yourself to be lifted up by someone else is very powerful indeed. And look at what Jesus does when he finds out about John's message. Good. Look at verse 24. When the messenger, messengers of John were departed, they came, they told Jesus, he sends them away. When they were departed, Jesus began to speak to the people concerning John. Here's what he says. What did you people go out to the wilderness to see? A couple of years ago, he's looking at his crowd, and he says, a couple of years ago, all of you flocked to the Jordan River to find somebody. You all went looking for someone. What did you go looking for? Did you find what you were looking for? What did you go to see? What did you find? Did you find this pansy? Did you find this weakling? Did you find this lone blade of grass just swaying in the wind? Is that what you found? A reed shaken by the wind with no firm foundation? Is that what you found? No, that's not what you found. Keep reading. Verse 25. What did you go out to see? Did you go out to find a man clothed in soft raiment? Did you go looking for a weakling, a pansy, a guy dressed in linen cloth who never put a hard day's work into his life? Is that what you went looking for? That's not what you found. Did you find a guy dressed like a namby-pamby? No. And then Jesus, as he does every now and then, you've got to look for them, but he gets really cutting sometimes. He says, no, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately, they're in the king's court. Well, okay, master, who's in the king's court right now? The cat who threw John in prison. The reason he's there in the first place is because of the guy who lives and dresses delicately, who's never done a hard day's work in his life. Herod and those who side with him. No, you didn't go looking for someone like Herod. You didn't go looking for some namby-pamby, weakling who wavers in the wind when his, when his lady, his, his dalliance, tells him to cut off someone's head. That's not who you went looking for. You found someone far greater than that. Keep going. Verse 27. No, 26. What did you go out to see? A prophet? And all the people say, yes, thinking that's his point. Yeah, yeah, we went looking for a prophet, and we found a prophet. And Jesus says, yeah, you found a prophet. You found much more than a prophet. You found a greater than a prophet, 26. I say to you, much more than a prophet, you found he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who will prepare thy way before thee. You found the one about whom the prophets were speaking of. You found the prophet prophesied about. You think it's just the Messiah that they prophesied about? No, you found the one who was prophesied about to prepare my way. You found that great person. Someone special and important enough for the Holy Spirit to make him a character in the Old Testament by way of prophecy. For I say to you, 28, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than those born like John the Baptist. Now there's more, but it'll take too long to explain the second half. But the point he's making is there. You'll not find a greater one than John the Baptist. What did you go looking for? A weakling? You found a strong man. Did you go looking for a coward? You found a brave man. Did you go looking for a prophet? You found the greatest prophet. That's Jesus' words that he speaks about John, who thinks that Jesus has forgotten him, that the people have forgotten him, and if they had, Jesus makes sure to remind them. If you're someone who's struggling and you feel like you're defeated, never underestimate the value in just taking a little compliment. And by all means, this one came from the master. It's not little at all. People are looking at you. People are thankful for you. And people want to tell you. Let them tell you. And be confident in it. Last point, and then I'm done, I promise. Sorry it's been so long. I want you to remember. Same with Elijah. I want you to remember you're not alone. Go back in the reading to the part we skipped. Look at verse 20. John sends his messengers to tell them, go ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? And that's what they do. Verse 20. When the men were come unto Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, asking, are you really he that should come, or should we look for another? And in that same hour, now it doesn't say in response to this, but it's just, it is written the way it's written, that when they come, in that same hour, what does Jesus do? 
verse number seven, uh, verse number, sorry, 21. In the same hour, Jesus cures many of their infirmities and their plagues and their evil spirits, and many that were blind, he gave sight. These people come to Jesus and they have the question, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus says, hold on just a second. Here's a long list of people that I can heal, 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 heal. And they're sitting there watching that without any effort, without any desire of, of frame of recognition, just because this is what he's doing. Here's a blind guy, now he can see. Here's a deaf guy, now he can hear. Here's a mute guy, now he can talk. Here's a paralyzed guy, now he can walk. Like as though it's nothing, just as easy as I'm snapping my fingers, if not more so. And then Jesus turns to them, I'm sorry, do you have a question? Am I really he that should come? Actions speak louder than words. Jesus does all that, verse 27. Then Jesus answering said to them, Go your way and tell John what you just saw. Well, what did they just see? One miracle is enough to convince a man. And Jesus gave them an hour's worth. He gave them a litany. He gave them a schooling as the teacher can. And he says, now you go tell John everything you've seen. You tell them how the blind see, how the lame walk, how the lepers are cleansed, how the deaf hear, how the dead are raised. What was he doing in that hour? How the poor hear the gospel preached to them. And then before he sends them away, he says, and blessed is he who shall never be offended in me. Blessed is he who never gives up on me. What's the implication? I'm not giving up on you. Whatever your condition is, and those were physical conditions, he healed them. Do you think he can heal a heart condition? If he can heal a physical condition, and if he can heal a heart condition, can he heal a mental condition? I think my master can. But what he wants John to remember is, yes, I am the Messiah. I stood right beside you. I let you immerse me. I let you dip me in the water. I'm still with you. I am the Messiah. I will answer your question with action. Now you go back to him, you too, and comfort him with these words. He's not alone. Now you may feel like you're alone. You are not alone. Yes, you have Jesus Christ who can do all manner of miracles. But you also have us who are here to comfort you to give you the compliments you need and to remind you of who you are. Who are you? You're loved. You're needed. Get to work. And you're not alone. Now what's your spiritual condition this morning? Are you lost? We want you in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We want to put you to work saving other souls. But you've got to become a Christian first. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe him. Be baptized into him. Live faithfully for him. And he'll come back so you can live with him forever. Are you a Christian who is struggling? Maybe it's with a mental health issue. Maybe you feel defeated. Maybe you feel all alone. Maybe you feel your victories are hollow and pointless and of no value. They're not. We may not be able to cure, but we can encourage, we can help, we can carry you along life's road as long as you need. If you have some need, make it known right now. Please come as we stand and sing.